Aren't you glad we worship a good God? We started a series several weeks ago about uh, reaching the lost. Talking about the uh, great commission that Christ gave us when he ascended up in the glory. <clears throat> the title of the message is Walk the Walk and Talk the Talk. And if you really want to be a good evangelist, that's what it takes. Uh, we were talking in Sunday school about uh, speaking the word in truth and in love. We're talking about the concept of that whole idea. You know, when you talk about preaching the truth, it's from Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 to Revelation 22. And you got to teach the whole thing. And I, I fear today, I mentioned in Sunday school, I fear today that a lot of our churches today are guilty of preaching what people want to hear. And the reality is they used to stone the prophets for preaching what they didn't want to hear. And as a pastor, I think we have a call to preach the whole council. And if you stone me, oh well, I'm among good company. So uh, that's kind of how I see it. But we're to walk the walk and talk the talk. And sometimes when we talk the talk, we're spending, we're focused on that first, preaching the word and teaching the word. Sometimes when you talk the talk, you're not popular. You found that out? Anybody ever try to witness to, you know, I, I know when I first got saved that I wanted to go home and tell all my family and my brother and sister and everybody what happened to me. They thought I'd fallen off the, the milk truck or something. And by the way, I did used to deliver milk, so it was a, possibility that I fell off the milk truck but they thought I'd gotten gone nuts about the, yeah yeah on the milk bottle on the way down but uh, you know that's the reality of preaching the word of God Christ is the one who said they're going to hate you because they hated me first right so don't think that you're going to win friends and influence enemies by going out and preaching the word of God it's not going to happen that way but we're still told to go and to preach the word. The, the scriptures that we've been looking at here from Mark 16, verse 15 says, And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believes is and shall be baptized shall be saved, but he that believes not shall be damned. Yeah, that's pretty strong language. We read the scripture over in John chapter 3, that if you believe in Christ, you'll have eternal life. And if you don't believe in Christ, the wrath of God abides on you. I mean, that's the Bible, folks. That's not something I dreamed up. You know, there's only two types of people in the world, as I said last week, and that's the saved and the unsaved. The redeemed and the damned. The innocent, the forgiven, and those that are still guilty in their sins. The Bible says condemned already. That's the only two people, the only two types of people on the planet. My first question is, which one are you? And are you sure? Do you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that if your lights were turned out today, that you go to heaven? You know, I, I shared with a friend recently that's professes to be an atheist and told me flat out, when your lights go out, it's over. And I said, are you really sure of that? Because I, I believe the opposite. And I, and I pointed out to him, you know, you live by faith. He'd never heard that. You know, atheists live by faith. Atheists live by faith that they will never stand in front of Jesus Christ and give an account. They never, they, they'll never stand in front of any God. If they're a true atheist, they don't. They they talk about Christians taking the blind leap of faith. They've done the same thing. Their faith is in themselves, and in their own knowledge of the fact that they think there's no God. That's faith. My faith happens to be. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by, the word of God. We both live by faith. I'll take mine any day. Okay. You know. We're told to preach the gospel. Now, we talked at Sunday school. I was making fun of Keith a little bit. He did a little preaching yesterday at Congress Auto Parts. 
Said he had the whole place listening to him. And I, and I can imagine he did. I know Keith, when he gets going, man, he's like winding up a chatty Cathy doll. You know, and he can lay it on him because he knows, he not only, not with his Jewish background, he not only knows the, the, our side of it, but he's had the Jewish background as well. So he can lay it on him. Okay. It's a shame he can't get up here in the pulpit and do it, but that's okay. We love you anyhow, Keith. Good job, Keith. I'm proud of you. But we're told to preach the gospel in love. And that's our, that's our command. It's not, a, it's not an option. It's a command, okay? Give me the next slide. We looked at this last week. You know, we're told to, that the preaching of the cross is to them that what? Perish foolishness. You know, if you go out and you start witnessing, the world's going to think you're nuts. It's seldom, to be honest with you, in today's culture when you, they just open arms and they want to hear it all, right? I mean, you like it when it happens, but that's not the most of the time. When you go out witnessing, that's not how it happens. But to us that are saved, it's the power of God unto salvation, right? That's the, that's the dichotomy of what we're dealing with here. They don't want to hear it. They're resistant most of the time. But we've got the answers. And we're told to go give it to them. Give them the answers. The answers to life, we've got them. We've got the answers to eternal life. We've got the answers. How dare us keep it to ourselves? We've got the good news, and we're to go to preach the cross of Christ to those in need. Actually, as I say here, those that need it the most. Those are the ones that we need to go to first. <laughs> give me the next slide. Fanny Crosby, one of my famous hymn, fa uh, favorite hymn writers, wrote this, Rescuing the Perishing is the title of the hymn. It says, Rescue the perishing, care for the dying, snatch them in pity from sin in the grave. Now think about these words as we're reading down through them, okay? Weep over the erring ones, lift up the fallen, Tell them of Jesus, the mighty to save. Though they are slighting him, still he is waiting, waiting the penitent child to receive. Plead with them earnestly, plead with them gently. He will forgive if only believe, if they'll only believe. Down in the human heart. Crushed by the tempter, feelings buried that grace can restore. Touched by a loving heart, wakened by kindness, chords that are broken will vibrate once more. Rescue the perishing. Duty demands it. Strength for thy labor the Lord will provide. Back in the narrow way, patiently. Win them. Tell the poor wanderer a Savior has died. Give me the next slide. Rescue the perishing. Care for the dying. Jesus is merciful. Jesus will save. Now, I'm going to share with you a little bit of my personal opinion for whatever it's worth i don't like to do it too often but this to me is real music the theology of fanny crosby hymns are second to none except maybe martin luther himself the mighty fortress right doesn't get any better than that but the truth of what we just read a hymn that we tend to Today, sort of putting on the shelf of, with all most of the traditional hymns, is the message of the evangelist. I mean, you know, I, I we could just read that three or four times today and go home. I don't need to do a whole lot of preaching past that. Now, we're going to focus on this in the coming weeks. Of course, I realize Carol just reminded me that Easter is what five weeks away, so I got to get on my Easter sermons. Uh, but. We're going to sidetrack this maybe for a few weeks, but we'll get back to this after Easter. I always like to preach about four or five sermons during 
the Easter break. But this hit me as I was looking at this uh, hymn this week and putting it in my sermon. This is a lady that got it. A blind woman. Could have lived her whole life bitter against God and against Christ. Because at five years old, she was made blind by misdiagnosis of a doctor. She spent the rest of her life in darkness. But this is the woman that got it. Wrote over 2,000 hymns. Can you imagine that? This hymn has the theology of what we're talking about when we talk about evangelism. Give me the next slide. Rescue the perishing. I picked up on that word, perishing. It's interesting in the Greek. It's the idea to destroy utterly. Now, for you Bible students, or uh, uh, Greek students, it's in the middle voice. And what that means is the subject, which is the person that's perishing, is actively involved. Now, I thought about that. How does that apply? You have a person that's born in sin, according to the Scriptures. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God, right? How do they live? Sinful. They live in their own human nature, which the Bible says is anti-God. The natural man receives not the things of God, because why? They're spiritually discerned. You know, I, 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 I thought I had it all together until I was saved. And then when I, saved, when I got saved at 22, I learned I knew nothing <laughs> of any value to God. And I was living my life my way. And I realized that with, after some Bible study that things had to change. I think of the scripture in 2 Corinthians 5 says, when you're in Christ, all things pass away. Be what? All things become new. I think of music. I'm a 60s guy. How many 60s guys do we have? Gals, okay? Guys, gals, 60s, hippies, whatever you were. I wasn't a hippie. I was a, I was a beach bum and a hoe dad and a hell raiser, but you know, I love the music of the 60s and uh, the Beach Boys. I mean, they can get better than that, right? Uh, huh? <laughs> um, but, you know, when I got saved, music was one of the things God had to change. Now, I learned in my own life that I had to quit listening to the junk, and I had to spend time listening to the good stuff, and then I fell in love with the good stuff, and now I can call the Beach Boys junk. Now, I'll be honest with you, I still have a problem with um, Endless Summer and a couple of those songs that, <laughs> when I was a surfer and that kind of stuff, but you know, I, I don't listen to the oldies anymore, because if I do, my mind tends to want to go back in those days. <laughs> And it wasn't really good. But our lives become what we are. And it starts with where you are spiritually. It starts with what you fed into your mind starting in this big. And as you grow up and what we were talking about in Sunday school about uh, teaching truth versus the cunning craftiness and the the, the doctrines of, of the world all around us, whether it be agnosticism or atheism or some other false religion or science and humanism and all the other junk that's out there today. And we become a product of pretty much what we put in our minds and we end up you know, practicing in our lives. And the Bible says that we're to be a child of God as a believer. We're to have the mind of Christ. So that means we got to absorb this so then we can teach it to others. And we have to understand when someone is perishing, when someone is unsaved, we really can't expect anything but this. They're acting out where they are. 
They're acting out what they understand. They're acting out what their parents have taught them or they've learned in school or they're learning from their peers or they've tried to experiment themselves and have come up with their own ideas of, of what the world is about. And we really can't expect anything else from them. And then we're told in that environment, knowing they're perishing and they're participating in their own perishing, we're told to go teach the Word of God to them. That's the job we're given. When we're told to go into the world and preach the gospel to every living creature, that's our task. We really can't expect them right out front. Oh, man, that sounds wonderful. Count me in. Even I didn't do that. It took me probably two years to get the hint. A lot of witnessing by Patty, who became my wife, and others. I was a slow learner. I had to see it, to be honest with you. I had to be slapped across the face with it. Thank God I finally said, count me in. But all of us, I'm sure, could get up here this morning and testify. Or if we were to able to take the time and each of us give our personal testimony about how we got saved, there's probably 90, 100 people here this morning. We'd have 100 different ways that we got there, right? Because no two salvations are the same. No two of us are the same. And how God reached us is different. I love to hear personal testimonies. You know, it excites me. And, I, and I'm going to tell you the first and most uh, dynamic witness that you have to the unsaved is your own personal testimony. When I teach evangelism, I, I like to tell you that, first of all, you need a, a, a one and a half to two minute witness of how you got saved. You also need about a 20 minute witness about how you got saved. And you ought, to, you ought to think that through in your own life, and you ought to have that right here so at any minute, standing in Congress Auto Parts, you can give a witness about how you got saved. Or if you're out to lunch for an hour or so with a friend that needs to hear about Jesus, you can give your 20-minute testimony. Lay some scriptures on them. Tell them a little more what God's doing in your life and give them a 20-minute witness. But as believers, every one of us ought to have that right at our fingertips, right at the, the tip of our tongue. We ought to be able to give that witness at any time, how we got saved and what God's doing in our lives. Because God's, if, if you do that, trust me, God will give you opportunities to use it. Okay? Give me the next slide. <clears throat> they believe not. We read this through John this morning. I just want to focus on verse 36. He that believes on the Son has what? Amen? I think that's a wave. Let's start right here and let's do our wave. Okay, and let's come back over here. Okay. Hey, we talk about eternal life around here. It's a wave time, right? I, for our visitors, I apologize. I told them we can do this at football games. We can do it in church. So I gave them permission to do the wave in church, all right? Uh. Those that believe we have eternal life, and I, I'm like you, thank you, Lord. Right? The second part of this verse bothers me, because I know a lot of people in this condition. Some of them I love very dearly. He that believes not shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on them. This, this, is, you know, this is a side of the Bible that we don't, you don't hear preached a lot today, that God is a wrathful God. He's wrathful because He's a just God. He's wrathful because He's a holy God. Sin must be recompensed. He's already taken out His wrath on Christ on the cross to pay for your sins. But if you reject that, you're still guilty. That's what the Bible teaches. That's hard teaching, but that's what the book says. That's who we're after. Those people that are in peril. Those people that are participating in their own demise because of their own rejection of the Word of God. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. 
whether it's read, whether it's heard from a pulpit of preaching, or whether you're across a dinner table talking to them, it doesn't matter. When you share the Word of God with them, and you share the hope of Christ with them, the Holy Spirit's are working on them, they're given a choice to make a decision. And that decision can be, be, be the difference where they spend eternity. Because they're perishing if they're unsaved. And they're participating in their own demise by their lack of acceptance and, and realizing that Jesus Christ died for them and saying, hmm, count me in. Okay? Give me the next slide. Uh, they repent not. Now, I'm a believer, and I'm, I've always been a student of Billy Graham. One point, I used to, the old tapes, you know, the cassette tapes. I had like 200 of them of Billy Graham um, crusades, and I used to listen by the hours and and develop sermons from them as well. Uh, I learned I can't be Billy Graham. I got to be me, so you're stuck with me, okay? But the reality is, Billy. Oh, I've never heard Billy really preach a sermon and given, a, given an invitation that he didn't ask about repentance. He didn't use it as part of his sermon. He's always been faithful about that. Repentance means that's when your life changes. You're not just making a head decision, oh, I want to be saved, you know, that sounds good to me. You've got to be willing that God is calling you to change your life. I learned real, easy, real quick that if you take this book and you study it and you apply it, it works. Gosh, can you imagine? You want to have a successful marriage, you do it God's way. You want to be a successful businessman, you do it God's way. You want to be a good mother, you do it God's way. You want to be an obedient child, you do it God's way. See, and it all works. He gave us the manual. We just got to apply it, right? And then certainly we ought to be able to show somebody else how it works. That's called evangelism. <laughs> Discipleship. They've got to repent. They're going the wrong direction. They need to turn around. They need to go towards God and do it right. Get in the Word. Get in the church. Get under good teaching. Grow your life in Christ. And that's what we call repentance. Scripture says here that they were present at the, it's the season. Some that told of him that Galileans, whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answering and said unto them, Suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans, because they suffered such things. I tell you, no. But except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. You know, what's he saying there? These Galileans were worried about these, these other Galileans that had been their blood had been intermingled with the blood sacrifices. Boy, those guys must have really been bad. You know what? They were probably all saved. That's what happens to martyrs today. Brother Bill shared in, 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 in Sunday school this morning, spent three hours with some men last night from the Middle East, and they're talking about all the Christians have been martyred. Thousands of them. In areas like Syria and, and, in, and in, in, in Iraq and Iran and all these different places. And, and, you know, fine, we finally heard about 23 this week. Trust me, folks, they're, they're dying daily for Christ. They're being martyred daily. The church in America is mostly ignorant to it. But it's going on. And... That because someone gets martyred doesn't mean they got sin in their life. It probably means they're serving Christ more. And we become a target for martyrdom. So he says, no, except you repent, you shall likewise perish. For those 18 upon whom the tower in Siloam fell and slew them, think ye that they were sinners above all? Men that dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you, no, except you repent, you shall likewise perish. What's he saying here? Either you repent. If you repent, you might get stoned. If you repent, your head might roll. If you repent, your blood might be mingled with the blood sacrifices in the temple. That's what he's saying. It's dangerous to get saved. <laughs> Seriously. 
Not so much in America because we're oblivious to that, but get saved in Iran or Iraq today where they are rolling heads. See, we, we, we live in this Mer American cocoon. We're in our third generation of post-war peace. Call it whatever you want. I'm not sure it's peace, but it's peace. And prosperity. We're in our third generation since World War II. We've seen nothing but peace and prosperity in America pretty much. We're oblivious to what really goes on around the world, except for a little news skip, clip here and a news clip there and a news clip there. But the reality is, when you get saved, you repent. Your life will change. I tell people all the time, you've got to check your dipstick. You know, if there's no oil at the end of it, you didn't get saved. <laughs> you know, you've got to have the anointing. You've got to have the Holy Spirit in your life. Give me a slide. <clears throat> Rescue the perishing, those that believe not and those that have repented not. That's who we're after. Okay? Rescue the perishing, care for the dying. Jesus, the merciful one, will save, right? Now, I've thought about where is our culture today in regards to this issue right here? Even where is the church today? in regards to this issue. Give me the next slide. What does Fanny say? Care for the dying. Now, we're going to pick up on some of this down the road, so I don't want to camp out too long on it, but this dying here is spiritual, not physical. Now, I think we can care for the dying person physical needs, we can be there to care for them, but the reality is if they're unsaved, you need to be using the opportunity to witness. Amen? Now, some of our visitors haven't heard this, but most of you know I had the privilege to lead my mom and dad to Christ last year. Dad, 91, three weeks before he went to see Jesus. Mom, 89, six weeks before she went to see Jesus. I thank God for the time in their elderly years I was able to just care for them physically and did a whole lot of witnessing while I was caring for them. And thank God my prayer for two years was that God would save them and take them before they suffered, and he did both. And I can stand up here this morning and tell you I don't even rejoice, I don't even mourn my parents. I miss them, but I can't mourn them. When I watched them get saved, and within weeks God took them to glory, when both of them were, you know, having physical issues and couldn't wait to get out of here, I just want to make sure where they were going when they did. Thank God they made the right decision. Amen? How can I mourn that? I praise God. See? That, that's the ultimate, to me, that was the ultimate evangelism. Caring for the dying. See? I knew they were dying. I was telling them, you're going to meet Jesus soon. Are you ready? You've got to be ready. And it's, no, it isn't that you've been a good person. It has nothing to do with it. Christ died for you on that cross. He paid for every sin you've ever committed. You need to turn your life over to him. 91 years dad had lived without that in his life. You know what my mom's comment was to several after she got saved? She passed away six weeks later. She kept telling people over and over again, I just wish I hadn't waited so long. Just wish I hadn't waited so long. She was raised in a Baptist church. But she married dad at 19 years, 18 years old. Got away from him. She used to sing in a, she used to sing in a quartet. But never really gotten saved. And at 89 years old, her regret was that she hadn't made the decision earlier. I just thank God she made it. Amen? Amen. And that's the bottom line. Care for the dying. Snatch them in pity. You know, I tell people all the time, they're, 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 it, it, you may have had parents that were just horrible to you. Do you hate them or do you pity them? You can spend the rest of your life hating them. Fanny Crosby says, pity them. The Bible says, pity them. You know how many people Christ went to that hated his guts? 
He died for them anyhow. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, right? Weep over them. I don't dare ask you when the last time you had tears over a lost person. We don't see near as many tears today as we did in the church when I first got saved, you know, 40 years ago or more. Very seldom you see people weeping over somebody that's unsaved. Weeping for the lost. We've lost that in the church. We, we're too busy praising Jesus. We talk about worship, but yet it's loud. Where worship really means prostrate on your face. I tell people all the time, it's really, it's praise music and it's worship on your face. It's not praise and worship. They're different. <clears throat> Lift up the fallen. Plead with them earnestly. I like to do that as a preacher. I struggle with the other one. Plead with them gently. You know, you, you preachers, we have trouble with that one. That's for you ladies. <laughs> you know. Tell the poor wanderer that Jesus has died. That's the bottom line. Give me the next slide. As I was thinking about this whole concept, it hit me how much time and effort and money we spend saving people's physical lives. Our government's all about it. And trust me, I spent about half of my life on the ocean. I thank God haven't gotten to this point out there. A couple of times I wondered, but was able to get home all right. But I've seen air sea rescues. I've had friends of mine rescued. One spent three days out there floating, four of them with three life, life jackets, trying to stay alive. So I know, that, I know that the horror of it. But the money that we spend and the effort and the training that goes into saving lives at peril at sea. Give me the next slide. We got some firemen here today. Risk their lives. Hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars in equipment, training, spending 72 hours on, what was it, 40, 20, huh? 20 on, how in the world did you get that job? 24 on and 40 it off? Where was I? Huh? Yeah, where was I? Boy, I missed that whole point. <laughs> yeah, because you could you, yeah, then, then it's, yeah, then it's, then it's different. <laughs> but again, an area of rescue and safety for cult for people and, and our culture and, and as taxpayers, we spend hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars for first responders. All right? Give me the next slide. I'm just thinking it through here. I've only seen snow twice in my life, so I really can't relate to this, but I've seen it on TV where avalanches come down and wipe people out, and they go up and they do this, and they've got helicopters, and they've got dogs, and they've got snowmobiles, and they've got snow machines, and I mean, every, looking for 10 people buried in snow. And I understand we're trying to save people's lives, right? Physically. I understand that. I'm not downplaying any of this stuff. But that's how important saving a physical life is to the culture. Give me the next slide. And how many of us were glued to our TV, the one down here in the corner, when 33 men for almost two months were down in the Chile in, uh, back in 2010 in the Chilean mine? And they spent hours drilling another hole to get down to them. I remember one, or, one at a time they're coming up in that elevator that they put down that ele elevator shaft we were all glued to our tvs watching it for hours saving those 33 men and the time and effort that goes into that when something like that happens give me the next slide three died in this out in colorado and again i'm not diminishing what we do to try to save people's human lives give me the next slide One of the malefactors which were hanging 
railed on him, saying, If you be the Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answered, rebuking him, saying, Do not fear, God sees you are in the same condemnation. And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Today shall you be with me in paradise. That's the ultimate rescue. Give me the next slide. Lord, remember me. How much time and effort do we put in? And I ask you, which one's more important? Saving a physical life? Or saving someone for eternity? Which is more important? Now, we really can't expect the culture to spend a lot of time and money on this. Okay? We really can't. Because they're unsaved. They're going in the other direction. They're all about saving the physical. So we, we can't expect fire trucks to come in here today or helicopters to come in here today and preach the gospel. Can't expect that. But I ask you, which is more important? Somebody's eternal existence? Or somebody's physical life? Really? Really? Give me the next slide. Get out of here. <clears throat> Do you know who needs to be rescued? Yes, sir. Who do you know that needs to be rescued today? Do you have a list of three or four that you're witnessing to on a regular basis? Or are you taking the time to call them up and take them out for coffee or, or you know, invite them over to your house for dinner, doing something to, to open the door to witness to them? Are you? Or are you, are you're on your knees daily praying for them? That God would use you or somebody else to come into their life and witness with them? Are you burdened for them? As Fanny Crosby says, do you weep over them? See? That's our call, folks. That's why God's got us here. <laughs> Go into the world and preach the gospel to every living creature baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and then teaching them to observe all things that He's taught us. And that's our command. That's the heart of the message today. My invitation is twofold today. You may be here and you don't know Christ. It's okay. I've been there. The Bible says today is a day of salvation. No time like now. The Bible says the angels in heaven rejoice when one person comes to Christ. Amen? So we'd all rejoice if someone decides this morning that they want to give their life to Christ. If you're here today and you don't know Christ, when I come down, if you want to come down, we'll pray together, share the word with you. If not, if you think you might be embarrassed, come in later. I'll sit down and talk to you. We'll handle it, okay? God wants you saved. Then, then my, my, my other message is to the rest of you. You're like me, you're saved. Who do you know today? I'm going to let you come forward. You've got somebody really on your heart and you want to share it. I'll let you share it with the congregation. How's that? Okay? You know? But I want us to leave here this morning excited the fact that God has given us a job to do. And that's go out and win souls. Amen? Father, we thank you for the message this morning. Father, I pray that you would motivate this church to be an evangelistic church. I pray that you would motivate this church to be a discipleship church. I pray that you'll continue to use this church to be a dynamic body of Christ that loves on one another and cares for one another and meets one another's needs. A place that we people can come in and see the love of Christ shed abroad in each other's hearts here. Father, I pray that we can reach out and change this community for Christ's sake before it's eternally too late. You know, Lord, you know I believe we're living in the last days, and I believe the time is short for America when we're going to continue to be able to do what we do. And I pray that we'll be taking advantage of it here at Cornerstone. 
I pray that you motivate us to be evangelists and disciple makers for the kingdom of Christ. Lord, we want to give you all the praise and the glory and all the God's people said, amen. I'm going to be down front. Carol.